Welcome, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, to our virtual worship services at 1030 a.m. Uh, we know Happy New Year. Happy New Year, first of all, to all of you in virtual land. Happy New Year to you. Uh, we're just giving you a moment. I know that uh, we are still uh, logging in to our virtual worship services. We're going to give you just a moment or two uh, just to log in. I pray that your new year has been safe and sound, and we are thankful that God has given us another opportunity uh, to worship together with each other virtually, virtually. Praise God. Come on in, uh, our virtual friends. It is time for worship, uh, and we will move into our call to worship, our call to worship. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 8, 1 through 4, shares with us words like this. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hath set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is humanity that you are mindful of us and the son of man that thou visited us? Brothers and sisters, I call you uh, into worship. This is the first Sunday of 2022. I am excited. I am excited. I'm excited to be here. Brothers and sisters, I know that we are virtual, but I persuade you to get into a mind and a spirit of worship, although we are worshiping virtually. With that being said, brothers and sisters, let us pause for a moment of prayer. We want to pause for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you for this awesome opportunity. We thank you for allowing us to move from 2021 into 2022. God, we pray now that your richest blessings fall upon us. And Lord God, we're able to hear your voice in this new year. Lord God, let us understand uh, how sacred this time of the year is as we reflect on where you have brought us from and we contemplate where you are leading us to. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray uh, that the ministry of Pleasant Green uh, can be relevant in a world today. Lord God, we pray that we are able to touch the hearts of those who uh, live in the community around us. And Lord God, we pray that we're able to touch the souls of those who are in a global community that may be thousands of miles away. But Lord God, we pray that our ministry be meaningful and purposeful. Lord God, let our word be relevant. Let our worship be relatable. Lord God, let us uh, display a reaffirming relationship. Lord God, uh, let us share in radical hospitality and resolute giving. Lord God, we pray now in the name of Jesus uh, that we can engage your community as you have called us to do. And this is in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, as we move in the way of restorative community development. Lord God, let us be beacons of hope and beacons of light in the pleasant green community and world. This is with many blessings we ask in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, pleasant parishioners, again, again, again. Happy New Year. 
Um, I pray that you can give us just a little bit of engagement, a little bit, a little bit of engagement. If you are on the line today, uh, why don't you just give us an amen or why don't you just uh, hit an emoji? Just, just let us know that you are in the house with us, even though we are virtual. Uh, we are also praying for those uh, who perhaps are experiencing sickness during the rise of um, this Omicron variant. We're praying for all of our parishioners who have experienced sickness uh, during this time. Brothers and sisters, again, I am glad you're with us. Uh, however, we are going to move into the Word of God. We want to move into the Word of God. I know that it's only... Um, an amount of time that I can hold your attention when it comes to virtual worship. Uh, I know that you are doing all kinds of things wherever you are, but I'm just so thankful that you have decided to log in and engage with us. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, I think there is still a word from God. Although we are not in person, there is still a word from God. There is still a word from God. If you will go with me uh, to Matthew, one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Matthew, the 14th chapter. And we want to look at, we want to look at the 22nd um, through the 33rd verses. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of time uh, to get there and we will read. All right. This is what the word of God shares um, in the New Living Translation. It says immediately. After this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake, and he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while we, they were there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were frightened by the heavy, heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it is a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on water. Jesus says, yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong, the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink and said, save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him and he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God. After they had crossed the lake, they landed in Gennesaret. Brothers and sisters, just for a little while, we want to share with you about stepping out into new waters, stepping out into new waters. Grandfather always share with me, understand your audience and be able to preach to whatever audience that you 
are standing before. I understand, brothers and sisters, that we are not in the church building. I understand that, brothers and sisters, uh, that there is a different cadence and rhythm uh, to preaching uh, also when I'm alone, but there is still substance in what I'm sharing with you. So I'm going to uh, approach this particular text um, in a teaching manner, if you all don't mind. Brothers and sisters, stepping out into new waters, stepping out into two, into new waters, and I pray that we are able as maturing believers to step out into new waters in 2022. There are a few objectives to this lesson that I would like to share. Um, the first objective to this lesson is uh, I always desire for uh, the pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, members and friends, uh, to become familiar with the biblical narrative or the biblical text. In other words, know your Bible. Know what the Bible says. Uh, know the narratives of the Bible. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, that there are many, many, many believers when asked about particular stories or narratives of the Bible, they don't know. They don't know. So brothers and sisters, we want to familiarize ourselves with the narratives and the stories of the Bible. The second objective uh, to this sermon or this lesson is to help us to learn what it takes to discern the call of God. That's the second objective. I pray that we can discover what it takes to discern the call of God, to discern the call of God. Lastly, the last objective of this lesson or this sermon, I want to help us to learn how to respond to the call of God, in particular in this new year and in this new season. I want us to learn how to respond to the call of God in this new year and in this new season. We're jumping off into the text, brothers and sisters, and as we jump off into the text, we look at this chapter, and this entire chapter shows a parallel between Jesus' journey with the disciples in first century Palestine and his progression through human history and the church at large. The king withdraws, and there is persecution against his servants. Uh, through his servants, he distributes uh, the precious bread of life to a hungry and dying world. His servants go through many storms and many testings and many trials. But as we consider the text, we see that Christ is there to tutor them and Christ returns to give them peace and to rescue them from their storms, from their disappointments, and also from the enemy. All right. So as we jump into the, this text, brothers and sisters, there are a few things that I want to pull out of the text. First of all, as we step into new waters in 2022 and beyond, um, Brothers and sisters, uh, one thing that we want to understand that as we step out into new waters, we want to recognize God's presence. As we step out into new waters, I think it is more than important to recognize God's presence. It's important to recognize God's presence. As we just kind of give uh, just... Uh, just the backdrop to this particular setting, Peter and his friends got into a little boat. Uh, it was on an afternoon uh, and they were to cross over the Sea of Galilee. Jesus wanted to be alone for a moment. So they were boating without Jesus, right? So Peter 
didn't mind doing that because, brothers and sisters, we all know that Peter was a fisherman. Peter was familiar with being on the boat. He enjoyed being on the boat. But this time, brothers and sisters, it was a little bit different than the many times before. Because this time, a storm arose. This time, a storm began to brew in. And it was not a minor storm. But if you look at the text, the Gospel of Matthew says that the boat was tormented. It was tormented. If you look uh, at uh, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, the King James Version says tormented by the waves. It was so violent that the only thing that the disciples could do at three o'clock in the morning, the sun had not even come up yet. The only thing they could do is keep the boat from capsizing. I'd imagine brothers and sisters that the disciples uh, weren't uh, the disciples weren't worried about uh, making it to the other side. They just wanted to stay alive. And this was the predicament that they were in. They weren't worried about uh, where they were going. They were worried about right now. And sometimes in our lives, our lives deals us this hand. We're not worried about making it to the other side. We just want to stay alive. Then one of the disciples noticed a shadow moving toward them on the water. Uh, and as that shadow got closer and closer, it became apparent that, uh, that it was a figure and it was a figure uh, of Jesus Christ. It was a Jesus Christ. It was a human figure walking on the water. And brothers and sisters, as I slow down a minute, I just want us to just take a pause, just take a moment and just uh, uh, imagine this particular uh, uh, issue uh, uh, or imagine how this narrative would perhaps play out in your world. Let this sink in with you. You are in the middle of the storm at 3 o'clock a.m., and you see someone walking toward you without a boat, without any kind of floating apparatus, and he's walking toward you on the water. The disciples were in distress, and the very person who could help them or who was able to help them, brothers and sisters, blessed be the God, he was approaching them, but he was not in a boat. And the disciples did not recognize him. So amazingly enough, and y'all walk with me as we get to the point in this text, amazingly enough, uh, being boatless did not stop Jesus from approaching at all. It did not slow Jesus down at all without having a boat. But the disciples were convinced that Jesus was a ghost. So they were terrified. And if you look at the text, they cried out in fear. In hindsight, we may wonder how they could have failed to know that this was Jesus. I mean, after all, he had performed so many miracles in the midst of them already. But Matthew wants us to know. Matthew is pointing to something critical, pleasant parishioners. Matthew wants us to zero in on this. Sometimes it takes eyes of faith to recognize when Jesus is around. Sometimes it takes eyes of faith to recognize when Jesus is approaching you in your life. Sometimes, even though no one else recognize it, it recognizes it, it takes eyes of faith to recognize when Jesus is doing something different 
than what he's done before her. I'm about to shout today. I, I'm trying to keep this a didactical lesson, but I'm about to shout today. Often, we are in the middle of storms. Sometimes uh, we're tormented by the waves uh, of life and we're disappointed uh, with doubt and we are not recognizing Jesus' presence. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we get in those particular places. As a matter of fact, when many of us face storms, we do things that are worse than the disciples. When many of us face storms, we forget about Jesus altogether. When we face storms, brothers and sisters, we leave the church, we get upset. Many times when we face storms, brothers and sisters, we stop coming to church. Sometimes we become so angry, brothers and sisters, we stop praying. When we face storms, brothers and sisters, we get to a point where we don't recognize Jesus in the midst of a storm. But what I want to share with you today is that Jesus is present even in the midst of storm. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to, when we go through a storm, stop going to church. I don't want you, uh, in the midst of a storm, to forget about God's word. Brothers and sisters, I don't want us that when we face storms, we desire our own preferences over the will of God. Brothers and sisters, sometimes, again, it takes eyes of faith to recognize when Jesus is around. And I want to really reiterate the fact that sometimes Jesus is around in the middle of your problem. But God wants you to recognize and see God's presence. As I consider the text, I have to ask a few questions. I really wish that you all were with me today in a Bible study context. So I'll ask these questions uh, by myself and you can uh, respond to them in uh, the thread. But firstly, what... Uh, the question, the first question that I would ask is, what was Jesus up to walking around on the lake at three o'clock in the morning? I just believe that the Lord was intentional about stretching his disciples' faith. Why was Jesus up at three o'clock in the morning walking around on a lake? It seems as if Jesus knew that his disciples were in trouble. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that I would suggest to you is that the Lord knows when you are troubled, even at three o'clock in the morning when you cannot rest. The Lord knows when you are in trouble. David Garland finds a clue in Mark's version of this particular story, Mark tells us that Jesus intended to pass them by. I know y'all, let this rest in your spirit, uh, spirit sizzle in your spirit, uh, but he intended to pass them by on the water. But when they saw him, walking on the lake, they thought that Jesus was a ghost. In other words, they misinterpreted who Jesus was. And I pray that you as a believer, as an individual, as a pleasant parishioner, do not misinterpret Jesus' presence when he comes. We want to look at Mark 6 and 48, brothers and sisters, uh, this is Mark's account of this text. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them 
walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. And this is not suggesting that Jesus didn't see them. He was about to pass them by. It was intentional. The next question that arises, why did Jesus want to pass them by? Did he decide to race them to the other side? Did he want to impress them with a divine stunt? In Mark's account, the verb uh, parakoma means to pass by. Parakoma means to pass by. It's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament as a technical term to refer to a theophany. Theophany. Uh, uh, Y'all don't be afraid of that particular term. Uh, theophany only means that uh, it, it's a, those defining moments, those defining moments when God made striking and temporary appearances in the earthly realm to select an individual or a group of people um, uh, for the purpose of communicating a message. In other words, what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters, of the theophany is when God appears in the divine, in the earthly realm, to get uh, God's people to do uh, or to hear or to believe in God. There are a few pl uh, places in the biblical text that we find where Jesus uh, appears to people in a theophany. Um, we see in Exodus 33 and 22, God uh, puts Moses in a cleft of a rock so Moses could see. And then God says, while my glory passes by, the Lord passed by Moses. That is a theophany. God appears to Moses in order to get Moses to understand that God is divine and he wants to point him in a particular direction. Uh, we walk through the text. Let's look at uh, 1 Kings 19 and 11. God told Elijah to stand on the mountain for the Lord is about to pass by. There are so many places in the text, you all remember another theophany where Moses, brothers and sisters, was at the foot of the hill. He climbed up the mountain and he knew that the presence of God was near. And the Lord, when he got up on the mountain, he had to take his shoes off. When he took his shoes off, he got into the presence of God. He looked up on a burning bush. The bush was burning, but it was not burning up. That's a theophany. In other words, what God was doing was appearing before Moses so that Moses could know that I am a living and a real God and I want you to do what I've called you to do. There are many other instances in the Bible where there is a theophany. God appears so that God's people can understand that God is real and God is divine and God is trying to point you in a particular direction. And I just am suspect and I just uh, have a sneaking suspicion that there is somebody on the line today, on the virtual call today, that has experienced a theophany in their own lives. God appeared to you and God desires for you to go in a particular direction. Let me calm it down. Let me calm it down. I, I, I'm trying to uh, engage in a teaching lesson, but again, I just keep feeling a preaching coming up on in me and on me. There's a pattern of these particular stories. In each case, God gets God's people's attention. And I want you to know, you ain't exempt. I know I said I, I know I'm a doctor and I say it ain't, but God tries and attempts and he will get our attention. You are not exempt. God gets our attention. God get there is a pattern to these stories, and each case God has to get people's attention through um 
whether it's a burning bush or whether it is a wind of fire or whether it is walking on water or whether it is a donkey talking or whether, brothers and sisters, the rocks are crying out, God uses theophanies to get our attention. With every person, God was going to call them to do something extraordinary. In each situation, the person that God uh, called felt afraid. And brothers and sisters, I want you to understand as God calls Pleasant Green to the place of ministry that God desires Pleasant Green to be in, I understand that we have a place of fear. But every time the people said yes to their call, they experienced the power of God in their lives. So when Jesus came to the disciples on the water, intending to pass them by, he was not doing it, trying to show off. He was not doing it because of a divine stunt. Brothers and sisters, what we have to realize uh, is that miracles happen in our lives, brothers and sisters, and it is not because God is trying uh, to create a show. But what he was doing is revealing his divine presence and power. Only God can do such a thing. God alone treads on the waves and the seas. What's that song? I wish we were on call in response today. Uh, but there's a song that the old African-American church sings. It says he plants his footsteps way out on the sea. I'm I'm a I'm a pause on that, but we gonna go we gonna go forward into the lesson. It's interesting that the disciples entered the boat in the first place at Jesus' command. Uh, they would have to learn, brothers and sisters, that obedience is no guarantee for us to be spared adversity. And that's one of the things that I've been teaching Pleasant Green and whatever context of ministry that I am in. Brothers and sisters, obedience to God is no guarantee to adversity. You can be close to Jesus. You can be Jesus' twin brother or sister, but you're going to experience adversity. Look at these people. They were on the boat. There, were, there was also an instance where the disciples were on the boat with Jesus and Jesus was asleep. But yet and still, they experienced a storm. I want you to know that you are not exempt from adversity. We see the storm and the storm gets their full attention. Jesus decided that it was time that the disciples got to know Jesus a little bit better. It was time for them to understand who this carpenter was that they were following. Jesus reassured them that you can trust me. And I want you to understand as you get closer to the Lord, you can trust the Lord. You know my character is what Jesus is saying. You've spent time with me and you know my competence. You can safely place your destiny in my hands and take courage. But they didn't fully grasp it. But God was visiting them, walking on water in the flesh. Matthew wants his readers to know that Jesus often comes when least when it is least expected. I want to say that again. Jesus comes many times and oftentimes when it is least expected. If you look at the text, 
He comes, first of all, at 3 o'clock a.m. in the morning. And also, he comes in the middle of a storm. I think it's a good place to say that trouble doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Somebody ought to tweet that. Somebody ought to post that on Facebook. Somebody ought to post that on Instagram. I want you to understand that trouble does not mean that God has abandoned you. So don't get upset with the church. Don't get upset with God. But that does not mean when you face uncertainties, when you face heartaches, when you face disappointments, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that does not mean that God has abandoned you. God is trying to stretch you to understand that as you get closer to him, you will experience heartaches, you will experience pains, you will experience tears, trials and tribulations, but God will bring you through. And I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that we walk by faith and not by sight. This is not Pastor Letcher just blowing smoke or pulling your leg, but scripture shares with us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. I want you to know that even though we experience trouble, I don't want you to feel that God has abandoned you. You've got to grow in your Christian walk to understand that God is still present and God still desires you to search for God even in those uncomfortable moments. Understand that God is still present even when you face difficulties. I'm reminded of a story uh, that the church of, yes, of the yesteryear used to tell. I remember uh, this story. Uh, brothers and sisters, they used to tell about a man that was walking along a beach. I, I know many times it's, it's in Christian um, art, it's in Christian um, literature, uh, but this is a story they used to tell. And the story was that a man was walking along the beach and he was walking with the Lord. And as he was walking with the Lord, he was talking with the Lord and said, Lord, I appreciate you walking with me. You have been engaging with me and, and, and telling me that I am your own. Uh, but as I look back over my life and I look down the beach, oftentimes I see that there is only one set of footprints because the man thought he was walking alone at those times, but Lord engaged him. He said, I, I, I know that there are sometimes you feel alone and I know that there's sometimes you feel as though uh, that the Lord has abandoned you. But what I want you to understand that as you walk along the beach, when you see those one set of footprints in the sand, it was not you walking alone, but it was me carrying you when you were too weak to walk by yourself. I want you to understand, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, that God never abandons you even in your troubles and your trials and your tribulations. God is still present. Don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. God is still present. Dell Runner notes that according to the Holy Scriptures, human extremity is the frequent, frequent meeting place with God. I, I want to say that again. Human extremity is the frequent meeting place with God. Somebody ought to tweet that too. Brothers and sisters, our frailty is the frequent meeting place with God. Those divinely appointed defining moments will come with you and me. And when we have trouble and when we have difficulty, 
Brothers and sisters, we can reflect on those times. And when we reflect on those times, we can discover that that is a frequent meeting place for us and God. It's a time where when we have trouble and when we have sickness and we when we have issues that we cannot solve on our own, that is a frequent meeting place with us and God. In other words, we find ourselves engaging with God as the old saints used to say that we find ourselves a sacred closet and we begin to pray. I didn't mean to get so emotional. Let me return to the text, brothers and sisters. Uh, but when we find ourselves where we're struggling and when we find ourselves at a place of trial, we can understand that that is a frequent meeting place uh, of us and God. Uh, sometimes God puts us in those places so that we can engage God in prayer. I want to highlight another thing, and I'm about to let you go. I know you want to have brunch, uh, but before you have brunch, there's a couple of things I, I would like to share uh, in this particular pericope. Um, we look at this text, there were 12 disciples. In other words, those 12 disciples, they were close to Jesus. There were 12 disciples in the boat, but 11 of them did not see Jesus. 11 of them did not recognize the voice of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, uh, although Peter has his particular issues, his shortfallings, he recognizes the voice of God and he recognizes where God desires to lead him. Twelve disciples, they were in the boat, but yet eleven of them did not respond to the Lord's voice. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because all of us have been in that situation before. Perhaps it was because of the confusion. Perhaps they were at awe and wonder and in disbelief or a little bit of all of those emotions. But one of them, one of them, that lets us know, brothers and sisters, the majority is not always right. Brothers and sisters, the majority, majority of them did not hear the Lord, but Peter was the only one who heard them and he desired to be where Jesus had called him to go. He recognized that God was present even in the most unlikely places. He realized that this was an extraordinary opportunity for a spiritual adventure in growth and Christian maturity that he had never, ever seen before. So he got an idea and he decided to do something radical. In ministry, brothers and sisters, we are existing in a time that we have never seen before. It is safe for us to do something radical, to follow the Lord. I, I have one more thing. And, um, well, I, I have two more things, but we're going to try to, we're going to try to share these particular pieces before we get out of here. Uh, when you begin to step out into new waters, one of the things that my prayer is for you is that you discern between faith and foolishness. There's a lot of foolishness going around in our world. There's a lot of unfound um, um, proclamations. There's a lot of things that don't even make sense that is not even supported by any kind of science. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that we've got to get to a place uh, that we discern faith over foolishness. Let's look at the text. Verse 28, Peter blurted out to Jesus, if it is you, 
command me to come to you on the water. So I have questions. Next question is, why does Peter ask this question? And why does Matthew include this detail in the gospel? This is not a story. Uh, what, what this leads me to believe, brothers and sisters, this is not a story about risk taking. It is primarily, brothers and sisters, a story about obedience. But brothers and sisters, what this is ultimately pushing me to share with the pleasant parishioners is that uh, we have to discern between the authentic call of God and what might be a foolish impulse on our parts. We got to discern between the authentic call of God and from what might simply be a foolish impulse on our part. Courage alone is not enough. It must be accompanied by wisdom through discernment. I want to say that again. I, I know I'm holding you just a little bit longer than I initially desired to, but I, I think this is important to share with you. The courage alone is not enough. It must be accompanied by wisdom, um, thorough thought, and discernment. Matthew is not glorifying risk-taking from it uh, for its own sake. This is not a, a, a ministry. This is not something that we could just jump into. Jesus is not looking for. Uh, I, I watched on TV the other day, brothers and sisters, that certain people get excited about um, certain risk-taking factors. As a matter of fact, it says that it opens up dopamine in our minds when we do certain things. It, it we get adrenaline. We there are certain things that we do risk-taking uh, that satisfies us. But what uh, this text is trying to get us to understand that the Lord is not looking for those just simply risk-taking disciple not he's not looking for those bungee jumping hang gliding and tornado chasing thrill seekers walking on water is not something peter does for recreational purposes this is not a story about extreme sports but it is a story and a narrative that pushes us to extreme discipleship. This means that before Peter gets out of the boat, he doesn't jump out on foolishness. He makes sure that number one, it is a good idea. And number two, that Jesus really called him to do it. That's why he says that, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come. Command me to step out on water. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, before we jump out on a notion, be sure, be very sure that the Lord has called you to step out of the boat that you are in. And in the darkness, I think Jesus perhaps smiled at Peter. Perhaps even in the darkness as he looked at Peter, perhaps in my divine mind's imagination as I consider this text, Jesus perhaps even chuckled. As I look at uh, different movies like the Karate Kid or the series Cobra Kai, I see uh, him developing young people and I can see Jesus developing us. And when we get to that place, brothers and sisters, where we are developed enough where it pleases the Lord, I'm sure that the Lord is pleased with Peter that he's consulting Jesus. Lord, is it you calling me to these unsure waters? Is it you calling me into this life of adventure? He decided he wanted to be a part of the history of 
walking on water. Last thing I say, and I'm done. Brothers and sisters, if you want, if you really, if you really desire to step out into new waters this year, you got to get out of the boat. You got, you, we, we've got to get out of the boat. Pleasant Green, we've got to get out of the boat that we have once been in because God is calling us to step out into new waters. I understand that it may be scary. I understand that it may be new. I understand that it may be different. The reason why I understand as I reflect on what has happened in the text it was night, 3 o'clock a.m. Not only that, just being night on the sea is scary. Not only that, brothers and sisters, the storm was brewing. The winds were blowing. It was in the middle of a storm that Jesus called them to, or called unto Peter to get out of the boat. Brothers and sisters, if you hadn't realized that we perhaps are in a storm, we're in a pandemic. We're at a juncture in the life of the church where God is calling us to get out from where it is safe and comfortable. God is calling us to a new horizon. God is calling us to do something that is radical and radical following calls us as believers. To step out of the boat. I know the waters are rough. I know the waves are high. I know the wind is strong. The storm is out there. And I know brothers and sisters. You're trying to hang on to what you have known. For so long without capsizing the boat. But if you don't get out of the boat. Brothers and sisters. I know that we're. If we, we get out of the boat, brothers and sisters, boat might sink. But if you don't get out of the boat, it is a guaranteed certainty that you will never walk on water. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. I believe there is something I believe that there is someone inside of us who tells us that there is more to life than sitting in the boat. You were made for something more than merely avoiding failure. There is something inside of us that wants to do radical ministry. To leave the comfort of our routine and traditional existence and abandon ourselves to the high adventure of following God. So I want to ask you, what is your boat? It's 2022. God is calling you out of your boat. What is your boat? Whatever your boat represents, whether it represents safety and security to you apart from God himself, get out of that boat. Your boat is whatever you are tempted to put your trust in outside of God. Your boat is whatever keeps you so comfortable that you want to give, uh, that you won't give it up even if it's keeping you from joining Jesus on the waves and the radical waves of life. Your boat is whatever puts or pulls you away from the high adventure of extreme discipleship. Want to know what your boat is? Your fear will tell you. Just ask yourself this. What is, uh, what is it that most produces fear in me, especially when I think of leaving behind those fears and stepping out on faith. Brothers and sisters, the door of the Lord's house is open. The virtual door of the Lord's house is open.
If you would like to become a part of the ministry of Pleasant Green, the door, the door is open. There are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, you can join our church um, by sending a an email to ghpruitt at gmail.com. Well, brothers and sisters, you can send uh, a voicemail. You can call our office at 314-535-7548. Uh, you can leave uh, a voicemail there. Whether you leave an email or a voicemail, we will respond to you uh, as soon as possible. We are thankful for you and we're grateful for your presence. Brothers and sisters, I know this is the new year. And we want to engage in the Lord's Supper. We want to engage in the Lord's Supper. This is the first Sunday of the year. And we want to engage in the Lord's Supper. Let's pause for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for allowing us to uh, make it into this new year of new blessings and new opportunities, new horizons, uh, new steps to take out of the boat. God, we ask that you have mercy upon us, that uh, you help us as we remember your bleeding and your suffering and your broken body, that we engage in the Lord's Supper worthily. God, we are not worthy, but Lord God, let us lay uh, those alts aside, and those issues aside, uh, let us lay down our issues so that we can engage worthily. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. I'm going to give you just one second, one second, one second, one second, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds uh, to grab uh, a little bread and a little juice uh, so that we can engage in our Lord's Supper Amen. Amen. Help somebody out. Go get somebody some juice. Somebody go get somebody some juice and we're going to engage into the Lord's Supper. While you're doing that, we're going to read what scripture says about the Lord's Supper. Uh, John 6, um, 53 through 58 shares with us what Jesus says when it comes to engaging in the Lord's Supper. Says Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat or meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He or she that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he or she shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, that um, this is not what saves you. Uh, but brothers and sisters, we do this because we are saved. Brothers and sisters, let us get together and let us commune together. Let us commune together. Again, scripture shares with us, we do this in remembrance until Jesus comes again. We want to pause for just a moment of prayer. 
But right before we pause before prayer, I know that uh, scripture gives us a description of how the Lord's Supper was taken, but it is not a prescription. So I want to share a couple of things before we uh, leave today. Uh, we're thankful for your continued generosity. We're thankful for your continued generosity. I want to share a couple of ways that you can continue to give to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church in a spirit of generosity. You can send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church at uh, 1220 REB GH Pruitt Place, uh, 63113 St. Louis, Missouri. You can send a check or money order to that address. Or, brothers and sisters, if you're technologically savvy, uh, you can look us up at www.pgmbcstl.org and you can give there electronically. Usually, uh, the giving tab is to the left. You click on the giving. Or, if you're on your laptop, uh, it is right among or along the center. Click on giving. It'll give you several opportunities to give. And there, brothers and sisters, you can give electronically. We thank you for your giving. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says that we can't beat God's giving. Also, Proverbs 3 and 9 says uh, to honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your income. And we thank you for your continued giving. Also, brothers and sisters, we recognize all of our guests. If you are a guest of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, we're thankful for your presence. We understand that you could have gone anywhere, uh, at any time, any place, uh, but you decided to come and share with Pleasant Green today. And for that, we are thankful. With that, For that, we are thankful. With that being said, brothers and sisters, we want to say a word of benediction. I pray that this worship service has been meaningful and purposeful. I pray that it has been inspirational and encouraging and inspiring and evoking, evoking you to live a life that is pleasantly purposeful for all people in God's sight. Let's say a word of benediction. God, we thank you for this new year. We thank you for new opportunities. God, we pray uh, that you help us to understand the biblical narrative. God, help us to understand or discern your call. And Lord God, after we discern your call, help us to understand how to respond to your call. God, we pray that we are a ministry that is pleasing to you. Lord God, let us be biblically Founded And Lord God, let us be a church that responds to you, God, when you've called us. God, we ask, we pray right now that you have mercy upon all of those who are sick and all of those who have struggles today. God, we ask that you heal those uh, and give them a speedy recovery. Uh, those who uh, are sick or those who have been in the hospital, those who are experiencing uh, bereaved moments. God, you know every parishioner, every partner of Pleasant Green. God, we ask that you have mercy upon them. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before God's presence with exceedingly joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Let us all say together, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, amen. Go ahead and type it on there. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.